22nd day of October 2018, allegedly, according to that thing we call a calendar. And this indeed is the Ocelli Effect, broadcast live from the facilities of Ocelli.com, but also heard on a variety of other networks. Now, just before airtime, I was not hearing from Jordan Maxwell, so I did not uh, think he was going to show up. Guess what? He actually has. So I was going to take calls and all that, but I'll tell you what. Let's split the difference. How about in the second hour, we'll take phone calls uh, for Jordan, and let me connect with him right now while I'm speaking to you. And, uh, you know, I, I just had not heard from him, so I wasn't sure if we were doing the next part in the series tonight. And uh, evidently, I have Jordan Maxwell with me. <laughs> so, yep, I think so. How, how are you, Jordan? Uh, I'm okay, I think. I I just fell asleep here at the desk. I was just, I, I, I didn't realize that you needed me to contact you. I thought I had already let you know I was going to be here. Well, but, no, yeah. I, I wasn't sure because last week you got busy and I wasn't sure if you were back from, you, you'd taken a little short trip. So I no, wasn't I sure. know, I know, and I appreciate that. I didn't, and I didn't contact you. Uh, no yeah, worries. I, I was here. I'm here. No worries at all. You know what? I can do this on the fly anyway. As I said, oh. in the second hour, here's what we're going to do, though, Jordan, a little change up, I think. We don't okay. normally take phone calls when you're here, but I promised in the ads before the show that I would. So in the second hour, if somebody wants to call in and talk to Jordan and ask him a question, I think that would be a good thing to do. What do you think? I think that's a great idea. Okay. Yeah. So here it is. If you save the number for the second hour, it's 252-301-2255. If somebody is listening internationally, the thing is you can contact me on Skype and you can call in for free. Not a problem. I'm Charles.Ocelli on Skype. If you send a contact request, I will add you in. That's simple. Now, all of that having been said, you got to know that you got to go <laughs> to Jordan Maxwell show. Dot com. That's right, jordanmaxwellshow.com. Why is that? Because that's the only website that is actually Jordan Maxwell's website. So jordanmaxwellshow.com is the place to go. And what can you find over there? Well, a couple things. First of all, Jordan's a lot of public stuff for uh, you know people to consume, take a look at, link to as far as Jordan's work goes, but also the Research Society where there is a button. You can join that very easily. You can make a donation over there. You can send Jordan an email over there. But also there's some videos on demand now, which you can purchase for much less than you could have uh, ever bought uh, a DVD copy and had it shipped to you by sending a couple of bucks in. Boom, you've got it instantaneously. You get the download from jordanmaxwellshow.com. Just got to follow the directions. But I urge you to explore the whole website, and that's at jordanmaxwellshow.com. Okay. So, <laughs> there we go. Now I've gotten everything out of the way as fast as I could, Jordan. And, well, um, all right. You know, it, it's it, it's an interesting time to discuss this topic, i got to tell you. Uh, I had some things in mind. I wanted to tell you about a little bit of the feedback that we've gotten, just so you know about it. Um, the Thus far... The majority of people have been uh, extremely receptive to what you've been talking about. Uh, a, a few people, uh, you know, had their usual gripes as, you know, as, as per normal, <laughs> right? Um, and th that, that's about the, uh, the idea of the uh, actual man, Jesus Christ, existing. Got us a little bit of flack uh, because, in essence, there's no real evidence for it. From a historian's point of view, and, well, you know what? There's also a lot of evidence that either somebody lived the exact life that would follow a whole lot of really fascinating, interesting things that happen in the heavens, or maybe it's just a made-up story. Um, and as with most of the stories that, uh, you know, they teach us in Sunday school, seems as though the majority of them were made up or they are a composite of legend, myth, and imagination uh, in some cases, but often coded with a great deal of truth, as in the, uh, the truth of the procession of the equinox being sort of let out there for people to understand what's happening, the way the sun travels, 
all of those things. Now, that provoked some interesting responses. Uh, some of the more dogmatic Christians not happy with it. Um, would you like to clarify anything about that particular position you took? <laughs> yes, yes, I would. Okay. Uh, I, as a matter of fact, I would very much so. I would like to say that I have no problem with with talking about God. I have studied the subject of theology for some 60 years, little by little, going back into ancient history where different religions have come from, the different ideas and belief systems. And when you do that, you begin to see where uh, the human family got the idea of God. Uh, most people do not know. They haven't spent 60 minutes looking at the subject of theology. I've spent 60 years, and I know that uh, that there's a world of information that's never been given to the common people about the world we live in. But the idea is that you were born into this world, and when you came into this world, you had no idea at all what you were doing. You were, as a baby, you just grow up and, and you just accept things that you are given to understand, and there's no reason to question anything, so you don't. But I did. I questioned everything. I've always questioned everything. And I began to realize when I was talking to adults and doing a lot of reading and researching and studying, I wanted to know what was going on with the world I live in. Where did these ideas about God come from? What is God? And so when you start defining terms and doing this kind of research, you begin to find out, slowly but surely, that uh, so much of history you've never been told. You've not been made aware of, of the ancient history. Well, I, I now have seen enough to believe that what we call Christianity is just one more religion on the earth. And I have said to you before, and I'll say it again, that if you were, depending on where you were born, would pretty much tell you what you're going to be believing about life. If you had born, been born in the, in, the, in the deep part of China, you would probably be full, you know, believing whatever the people in China believe. If you were born in Africa, you would have an African viewpoint on things. If you were born in Asia, you would be believing and following the Asian ideas and concepts. Uh, depending on where you were born is what you believe. And I understand that. And so we were born in, into Christianity. I was. And I started questioning things about Christianity when I was a child. And, and I told you about some of those questions I had. And then I began to find out that the Roman Empire was a very great and powerful presence on the earth, and that the Roman Empire, though it supposedly collapsed and, and fell in the 5th century A.D., in point of fact, it's still alive today. Rome is still dominating the world today that we live in. And, and, that, and I developed something called pattern recognition. I began to see the connection between things, ideas and belief systems and words and terms, and it just became obvious to me that we are living right now in the Roman Empire. And Rome was the home of Christianity. Christianity was came out of the Roman Empire, and today we are in America, and in England, uh, we are in the Western world, the Roman Empire today. America is the new Roman Empire, and so we have the Roman religion. Uh, you know, our, our, our country is run from a place called Washington, D.C. 
Washington, D.C. was originally, originally, hundreds of years ago, that area we call Washington, D.C. was referred to and called Rome. Rome. And today, uh, if you go back to the history of the Roman Empire, you will find that Caesar, who ruled the Roman Empire, he ruled from a place called Capitol Hill. And it was said in the history books, if you go back and read the history of the Roman Empire, that uh, Caesar ruled the Roman Empire from a place called Capitol Hill. Capitoline Hill. Well, we still have Caesars up on Capitol Hill. And Caesar ruled the Roman Empire on Capitol Hill from something called the Senate. And so we today have a Senate up on the hill. So we are still worshiping the old ancient Roman Empire. We're still part of it. It hasn't gone anywhere. It just mutated and evolved and become bigger. So today, our country of America is actually the Roman Empire. And that's why New York is is called the Empire State. New York is a center for the Roman Empire today. New York. Why? Because when Caesar uh, left out of Europe and crossed over into Britannia, which was Britain, Caesar set up his government in Britain in a place called York, England. And York, England was where Caesar ruled Britannia from, and this is why today we have a place called New York. It's in a New England, New York. And New York is the center for the Roman Empire today. That's why we have an Empire State Building. New York is the new Roman Empire. And then Caesar ruled from Capitol Hill, as I said, and so that's why we have today Capitol Hill near New York, very close. So once you understand that we are nothing more today than the Roman Empire, and this is who we are, this is where we come from, this is what we are, and we're still believing in in what is called the Roman universal religion. Rome was the world, and the old world was the Roman Empire. And so there was a religion. Rome had a religion in history that was called Mithraism. Mithraism was like Christianity is today to America. Rome, uh, the, the, the god was called Mithra. He represented the sun, S-U-N. And the religion of of Mithraism was that uh, Mithra was born of a virgin. He uh, died and, and for three days was dead, and then he rose again. He had a uh, his father was a carpenter, or you know, and and his mother was a virgin. He had twelve helpers, and twelve people to follow him. Twelve helpers, like the twelve apostles. And the entire story of Mithraism is exactly the same story that we have today called Christianity, but it was called Mithraism. The word R-A was at the end of Mithra, R-A, Ra. Ra is the sun god in Egypt. So it was the sun worship in Egypt that gave birth to Mithraism, the religion, in in, uh, the Roman Empire. Today, we still are worshiping God's Son, S-U-N, not S-O-N. And the Son was said to be our risen Savior. Of course, the Son, the S-U-N, is your risen Savior, because if it doesn't rise, we're dead in three weeks. The, this whole earth will be frozen over, and there will be no life on it. Uh, quickly, very fastly, we will lose the entire life on the earth if the sun does not rise. And so there's a reason why we have these stories and where they've come from and how they are, you know, how they have come down to us. And we were, like I said, where we are born, we're born into a belief system. And we don't know where it came from. We don't know why it's here. 
and most people don't care because they're too interested in trying to earn a living and pay for their pay their rent so they don't have time to think about such things as theology and religion philosophies and especially in a very materialistic society like the modern Roman Empire today we are very materialistic we don't think about the spiritual things we don't really think very deeply about anything really in America and this is why our country is in the shape it's in today and why the human family is, is in shackles we're all living like slaves because we don't think very deeply about anything and that's why we're in the case, the, the situation we're, we're in. So uh, I've looked at this because it's been part of my life. I, I, I love the idea of the ancient religions of the world. I love the ancient history of the world. I'm fascinated with thinking about the world I live in. What was it like a thousand years ago? What was my country where I live in, in Los Angeles? What, what 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 was there? What was here before Los Angeles? What was here ten thousand years ago? What was it like here on the earth? And what were people like? What were the people wearing? What did they eat? How did they live? And did they have a government like ours? And so when you begin to look at the world that we live in, you will find that. The more we change, the more we stay the same. We're still accepting the same old ideas and belief system that were around 10,000 years ago. Mm. And the Roman Empire still dominates the world today. The whole earth is dominated by Rome. This is why all the most important people in, in the world today, the industrialists and the bankers, all the internationalists, all the what we call the elite, they all go to Rome and end up on their knees in front of the Pope and kissing his ring. Why? Because the Pope is a holy father and he talks to God, so he is a God father. Right. And so this is why today I am doing what I do, trying to educate people as to where we and our ideas have come from. And when we talk about Jesus, there's more evidence that Jesus, the idea and the concepts about the story about the New Testament Jesus was already in existence a long time ago, that way before the Roman Empire, there was already religions that were teaching the same thing about a Messiah whose mother was a virgin. These kind of ideas about a virgin birth caused me to question because obviously there's something wrong virgins don't give don't give birth mm. what is that all about well now i remember now i find that when you're looking at uh, the sun the sun is your risen savior and uh, he promised he would come back he dies in the night he dies in the evening and his evil brother according to the bible jesus had an evil twin or an evil or an evil brother whose name was the devil we call him the devil which is nothing more than putting a d the letter d in front of the word evil becomes devil and take one of the o's out of god take one of the o's out of good and it becomes god god is good and the devil is evil just words just ideas the more you look into it the more you begin to see we're still bringing ourselves we're still crawling on our knees to the idea that there's someone who's going to be there to protect us we pray to God all the time to protect us to protect our family for peace and security and point of fact the more we've been praying for 2,000 years to God for peace and security and the, and the more we pray, the more wars that keep coming, the more bloodshed there is, the more violence between different religions. And then we find out what is the very basis for the religious beliefs that we have. Mm -hmm. And it's very simple. All you've got to do is open your mind and get a book on ancient history and read what the ancient world believed and what, and, you know, and where we got our belief systems today. 
we have been told, I grew up, I grew up hearing that the Jews were God's chosen people. In point of fact, the Judaism today is made up of seven different ancient cults. Most Jews do not know that. Almost no Christians know that at all because Christianity is supposed to be based on the ancient religion of, Jew, of the Jewish religion. The Old Testament is the first book. And then the second part of the Bible is the New Testament. So the New Testament is supposedly the fulfillment of the Old Testament. And people have told me, I've heard so many ministers say, isn't it wonderful the way God uh, allowed uh, everything that was prophesied in the Old Testament to be completely fulfilled in the New Testament? Isn't that strange how that happened? that everything God promised in the Old Testament would would happen, it all came about in the New Testament. And it's magnificent how that happened. No, it's not magnificent. If the same people wrote the old, wrote the new. (laughs) Very simple, very Mm -hmm. simple. All you got to do is hire about 500 of the top minds of Europe. Hire the the best intellectual minds that uh, that you have on the earth at one time, and bring them into Rome and set them down and say, write me a book that prophesies everything that's going to happen in the future, and then write me a book, uh, part two to that book, and explain how it's already happened. So that's where we get the Old and the New Testament. It looks like the same people who wrote the Old wrote the New. It's very simple to look at the Old Testament, read all the prophecies, and then write another book and show how it's all come about. Besides, Christianity, like Judaism, like Islam, uh, are, the people are referred to, the followers of Islam and the followers of Judaism, and Christianity are referred to as a people of the book, mm. meaning that, they, that those religions, those three religions are based on a book. They are the people of the book, so they have to have a book to base their religion on. Judaism has a book. The Old Testament, what we call the Old Testament, they call the Torah, and so that's their old book that they base their religion on. But then when you find out what do the words and the the very basis for the belief systems in Judaism, where did they come from? Were they already in existence in ancient cultures and just borrowed? Yes, that's what happened. That the, that the Jewish religion borrowed, purposely borrowed from far more ancient peoples. And they didn't tell you that they borrowed those stories. So when we're told that the Jews were God's chosen people, uh, you begin to see that's just a story. This is why the Bible is called the greatest story ever told. It's just a story. No, no one said it was the greatest collection of historical facts ever assembled. No, it's the greatest story ever told. It's just a story. And if you would want to believe it, that's fine. But if you want to do some research and find out for sure, then you're going to find out that the, by the, the three main religions today, uh, Judaism, Christianity, and Islam, all three come directly out of the Hindu religion. Mm. Uh, Hinduism it provides the basis for Judaism, Christianity, and Islam. Islam is filled with the gods of the ancient Egyptians, the gods of the ancient Greeks. It's, a, it's an old ancient tale that's been retold so many times that people still believe it. And all I'm doing is saying that you need to wake up and understand where your government has come from, where your religions have come from, where your banking and your military ideas have come from, your sciences and who owns this country, who owns you. And then you find out you are nothing more than a security on the world stock market. Most people don't know that. There's so many things the people of this country and the people of the world just do not realize and understand about their history. Nothing develops in a vacuum. Everybody is copying off of each other. I mean, we got in India, we have a whole motion picture uh, operation going on in uh, like Hollywood. It's called Bollywood. 
with a B instead of an H, not Hollywood, but Bollywood, mm. and shows how countries and institutions will copy each other. And the people don't know that. The people in India, they don't know. They don't understand that Bollywood is really uh, an Indian version of Hollywood. And, uh, and we don't realize that Islam is nothing more than an old ancient moon worship um, upon which Moses and, and uh, Ezekiel, what's his name, uh, uh, Abraham. Abraham mm-hmm. and Moses are part of an old ancient moon cult. And all three religions today call, say that they come from they come from uh, Abraham. They're called Abrahamic religion. Right. Well, if you want to do some homework and go to a library and study for about a year or two, all the books about Abraham and all the reference works and the biblical reference works about Abraham, you will find out there never was an Abraham. That's a made-up story. Abraham never existed. And right. if Abraham did not exist, and, and we know that, we know where it came from. It came from India. Right. Now we've, it, now, we've covered a great deal of this earlier in, in yes. the episodes, and i got to tell you, it is refreshing to hear you go back over all of this and give everybody sort of an instant recap Um, But fitting right in with what you're talking about, I'd like to read you an email because now I've got that stuff together. And, uh, guys, if you want to, um, in the second hour, we're willing to take calls at 252-301-2255. But also, if you're in the live chat room or if you're on my Skype and you wish to send in a question, or even if you're in my email at the moment, uh, you you, you feel like emailing in a question, we can do that. And I'd like to read to you uh, a question from Phil, who was extremely happy to hear the series on religion with you. Uh, anyway, I'll just read you the whole message, Jordan, okay? Uh, Mr. Ocelli, I am extremely grateful that you have been doing a series with Jordan Maxwell. I have seen and heard Jordan Maxwell before, but did not know who he was. Uh, your series on religion has given me a great deal to think about, and I have learned more in listening to these shows than I ever had researching the topic myself. (laughs) Um, Let's see. Oh, here's his question. Please ask Mr. Maxwell, because I have heard many different versions of the religious significance of what happened on 9-11-2001. Please ask Mr. Maxwell, he says again, please ask Mr. Maxwell, what is the truth about this? Many represent it as a ceremony of sorts that was conducted on the world stage. And New York is a significant city. So could we get the explanation from Mr. Maxwell as to what he sees in the ritualization of the these events? Sorry. Okay, a little hard for me to read there, Jordan, but but I got it. <laughs> yeah, um, uh, you, you know what fine. he's going after here, though, because many people have made claims that this was a, a blood sacrifice ceremony, that this was based on ancient religion, co- ancient religious concepts, that even the two towers uh, play a significant role, that the fact that it happened in New York, that this is a class of civilizations. Uh, which are, you know, at, at odds with one another because of the Islamo fascists wishing to strike at the heart of the American imperialism financial district, all of that. Um, but a lot of people have thrown various religious ideas into this, stating that this was done intentionally as a religious type ceremony. So, uh, I leave it open to you how you would like to, uh, uh respond to that. Uh, what, what are your thoughts about 9-11 and its significance? Uh, in a religious sense? Well, that's a very important question um, because I found out that 9-11 is a very important uh, date in the Jewish religion. Extremely important is 9-11 in the Jewish religion. It goes back to the idea that Jesus was born in September uh, and that was an idea is that the Messiah would come back and be back and, and, and would bring a new order in the world on September 17th. 
uh, 2001. I remember reading back, and I've got the documents I can send to you and you read them yourself. Uh, there was an organization in England many, many years ago, and I'm talking about back in the 1870s. There was, a, there was a movement, a religious movement in Europe and in England called the British Israel World Federation. And in the magazines that were published by the British Israel World Federation, uh, it talked about the coming of 9-11 in the year 2000, that there would be a, a great catastrophe would come on the earth and it would change the whole world, and it would happen in September of 2000, and uh, or 2001. And it's it's I I had the magazine, I photocopied the documents, I put it on my website. So if you go on my website, you join my research website. It's there uh, under important documents. You can read it for yourself, where it says that uh, September 11th. According to Judaism and the Jewish religion, was a, was a date when all the financial dealings of ancient Israel were collapsed. Uh, it, it, uh, it had to do with the banking institutions of the Jews in Jerusalem. That on nine eleven was the beginning of the new banking year. And all bills and everything had to be dealt with on 9-11 and all the all the uh, financial dealings of ancient Israel were cleaned up and re, resurfaced in, in a new uh, a, a new world order kind of thing for Israel on 9-11 I thought that was interesting then another article in the British Israel magazine called Destiny that talked about how Jesus would have been born on December, uh, on September 11th, and that in the P Great Pyramid there was the the prophecy that 9/11 would be a very important year for the coming of God's kingdom, that the kingdom of the Almighty God would begin at 9/11 in 2001 or 2000, and uh, I, I think that's interesting. I didn't say that. These are the these are the British Israel World Federation have said that based on all the ancient scriptures, and the Jewish uh, the Jewish concepts of of international law and international government, especially in relation to international banking. That nine eleven is a very important day for the settling of all financial deals around the world mm. for God's kingdom. And that Jesus would be born in September 11th. Uh, it's a, it's like I said. I don't have the documents with me to read them to you. But if you go on my website to Jordan Maxwell Show and join my research uh, website, which is called Jordan Maxwell Research Society website, uh, join it, and then you go to one of the folders. I've got all the different subjects in different folders, and you go to uh, interesting documents, all kinds of interesting documents. You'll find a lot of documents from the old, from the you know, 1930s, 1920s in Europe talking about the coming of God's kingdom will be established on the earth in 2000, uh, the year 2000 or 2001 on September 11th. And uh, and 9/11 will be the beginning of the kingdom of God on the earth, and therefore it will have to do with Jewish banking, and the and the birth of Jesus when he was born on 2000. He was born on uh, on 9/11, not 2000, but he was born on 9/11. So it's only right that the new order, uh, which Jesus founded, which we call Christianity, would be reestablished on the earth as a new government for the world in 9-11. So I don't write these things. I'm just telling you, I was doing research on the, on, the, um, on the British Israel World Federation and who they are, and they gave birth to, eventually, the British Israel came to America and because it was picked up by uh, 
uh, in the modern day, it was it was actually a very big religious belief system back in the 1870s in America, and it came out of Europe. And today we have the we I don't know if they're still around, but we have the Worldwide Church of God, but Garner Ted Armstrong, Garner Ted Armstrong's church in Pasadena. Uh, was promoting the British Israel World Federation ideas and belief systems about Jesus coming back in 9/11, etc. Uh, and the international banking cartels would be reestablished for the world, a new order in the world, a new world order. That's familiar, mm-hmm. and all of this goes back to religion. So well, I think there is a religious connection. Yeah, an interesting thing to point out here is that uh, there is today a British-Israel World Federation, which uh, online claims to have been founded in 1919, right? Yes, and right. They, uh, I, I guess they could have uh, pre-existed that as some other form of organization, you know, before registering or something. Uh, I'm wondering if it's exactly the same people. Because uh, it does seem to speak to exactly what you're talking about, and um, it's kind of uh, kind of interesting. They're actually registered as a charity <laughs> mm-hmm. at this point. But if you take a look at their website, uh, it, it's just I'm not going to read a lot from it, but let's just see what it is they're saying here to to back up what Jordan's saying about this organization and its goals. Um, it, it describes itself as an educational society. The Federation sets forth the essential theme of the whole Bible. It proclaims both the gospel of salvation and the gospel of kingdom as taught by our Lord himself. These two aspects of the Christian faith are complementary parts of the whole counsel of God. Um, while we never fail to present the Lord Jesus as the Savior of the world, we also proclaim him as the Redeemer of the lost sheep of the house of Israel, and in doing so bear witness to the continuity of God's servant nation. Now, what's interesting here is that uh, whether this organization was founded in the 1800s or 1919, it uh, would have preexisted the formation of a place called Israel on the globe. Mm-hmm. Because that didn't happen until some years later, Jordan. <laughs> so I, I find it interesting, but uh, they're very much about, you know, here, here's the tribes and here's where they belong on the planet and all that. And I'll give you guys a link to it uh, also along with the other links for this show just to show you what it was I was looking at. But uh, they are literally at, uh, you know, you can find them pretty easy, British uh, BritishIsrael.co.uk. And uh, there they are. And that was actually sent in uh, by a listener that was listening to us live at the time. So there you go. Uh, they also yep. they also posted your research society um, <laughs> link in the chat room at the same time. Thank you, Lori, for that. Uh, yeah, so the religious significance, though, could it be that there's more than one piece of religious significance here? Because I, I kind of chuckled when you said that this is the day that, uh, you know, all the banking would be finished, right? All the financial transactions would be finished. Well, literally what happened on 9-11 in an interesting sort of way, because I was rather close to it when it happened, uh, is that the financial world kind of went into a bit of a spin. A lot of things stopped, and a lot of business could not be completed on that day <laughs> yeah. because of the interruption. Um, that's, and and that's, that's right. literally what happened is that, you know, we, we've heard about the stocks and bonds that wound up being traded regardless of there was supposed to be certain regulatory concerns and things that had to be signed off on that never were. Those things went through anyway. Credit card transactions failed to work in the northeast of the country. I know that for sure uh, for a while. And a lot of banks simply closed because they had lost connection to uh, to a lot of their main offices. So, yep. you know, banks in other states, uh, probably in, throughout the country, and maybe even, you know, here we go again with the global connection, right? Uh, it right. seems like it would have disrupted business. Not completed it, Jordan. Number one. Number two, um, maybe that's part of the significance of it, but it seems to me like this was a, a, a multi-level message. Like there was more than one thing being done here. 
Um, oh, I'm totally sure yeah. of that. Absolutely right. I'm sure there was more than one thing happening at the, at that time. Someone uh, was stepping in to the world scene, a third party. There were two different sides going on, going at each other. But there's a third party uh, from what uh, uh, from what the great uh, uh, teacher that I I am fascinated with. Uh, his name is um, Joseph Farrell, and Joseph Farrell is an extraordinarily brilliant man who has traced down so much of what we understand today about world government and world catastrophe. And and according to his understanding, according to his work, and he's a he's a professor uh, in England at one time, and today he's back here in his own country, back here in America, and he's talking about something called the Nazi International, and I am totally convinced that he's absolutely correct on his terms he's using, Nazi International. There is an international movement going on on the earth today, which is moving the human race out of its normal patterns of life on the earth and moving the human family into a new order in the world, a new way of living, a new world order. Mm. And this is on the back of a $1 bill under the pyramid, as Novus Ordo Seclorum, which was new, a new order of Seclorum, Seclorum is a Latin word from where we get the word secular. Secular means of the world. So a novus ordo is a new order of the seculorum or the world, new world order. And it's based on the pyramid, going back to the pyramid with the all-seeing eye on it. Uh, all of this is dark stuff. Most people are not into this kind of understanding they don't know that it exists. I've been looking at it for many, many years and talking about it as far back as 1980, 1960, I mean, 1960. Uh, 59 is when I started looking into the esoteric world that we live in. And by 1960, I realized that we're being led, the human family is being led by secret societies, by fraternal orders by secret groups of ancient religions and ancient political societies, etc. And we were born into it. We just accept the world that we live in because we were born into it. We don't know anything about it. We have no idea what's going on. And so we accept everything just as it is. I don't accept anything the way it is. I know that there's a reason for everything. If there's a war, most people just shrug their shoulders and say, well, I mean, who knows how it happened? We just went to war, and it's just one of those strange things that happened, unfortunately. I don't look at life that, that shallow. I don't, I'm don't. i not that shallow to just shrug your shoulders and say, well, it's just too bad, I guess. You know, we, we went to war, and I don't know why. And it's, you know, it's unfortunate. No, it's not only unfortunate. Somebody caused it, period. Somebody caused it. You have, in order to have a fight, you have to have a fight promoter. I mean, you're not going to have a, a big heavyweight championship fight in Las Vegas without a promoter. You've got to have somebody who puts this fight together, who finances it, who gets the money behind it, and who and who orchestrates the war and makes sure everybody's in their place when the war begins, and too many things have happened in the world that show that it's all very well organized, and so I know that I can see that it's called pattern recognition. When you begin to see that the that the U.S. was actually going to be practicing uh, in case of a world catastrophe some kind of a terrible attack on America, and they were going to be practicing with the military, what would the military do if there was a massive uh, attack on America? They, so they, they held uh, some sort of a practice session on 9-11. The whole of the U.S. military was on alert to uh, uh, react to a world catastrophe, 
and then uh, 9-11 happened on that very day. Isn't that interesting that the United States military were practicing and preparing for some sort of a major catastrophe to happen in America? They all were on alert and ready to go. And, and for some reason, there was a major catastrophe happen on 9-11. And so I know that things like that don't just happen. Somebody made them happen. Somebody's behind the attack in 9-11. And when you begin to go back and look at the words and the terms and what where the money came from, follow the money, always, always follow the money. You will begin to see organized crime on a on a on a on a place that you have never seen before. You know you just don't understand how organized crime works at the top of the world, the way the internationalist elitist uh, plan their their operations. They plan their wars. First World War was planned. The Second World War was planned. The Vietnam War was planned. All of our wars are always planned. Mm -hmm. And somebody knows that when we're going to war, uh, that's why when uh, old man Bush, the father, was uh, asked about his uh, interest in uh, the TV news. He said, I never watch television news. I don't bother with it. It's just a waste of time. And he was asked, why would you say that the news, that nightly news on television is a waste of time? He said, because we make it happen. I know it's going to happen. I already know. How do I know it's go what's going to happen? I'm making it happen. I know it's going to happen because I'm the one who's paying for it. I'm going to make it happen. So when I see it, uh, what's the, what do I need to watch television to find out what happened when I'm the one that financed it? I know what happened. So, uh, you know, this is what I'm saying. If you do this kind of research, you begin to see that nothing is happening in this world by chance. Nothing. All fights require a fight promoter, somebody who has to put it together. And there's a, there is an organization in the American government, the U.S. government has a particular installation in, uh, in Virginia. I think it is Virginia or West Virginia. Uh, it's called the Department of, um, of Mil the War Preparation or something like that. I do. It's on my website. It's on my website. On my research website, I do a whole article about this company that's part of the United States government that says that they are in charge of preparing for war. They prepare for what's going to happen in a war, where it's going to go and how it's going to go. And they, they already know exactly when a war is going to start and when it's going to end and what's going to happen between time. It's already outlined and known before the country goes to war. It's already understood what we're doing. It's, a, it's some kind of a hostile takeover. It's some kind of a, of, of a movement that's going to enhance the power of the United States somehow in this world war. And, um, you know, there's all kinds of machinations going on in government and religion. The churches know the church leaders already know what's going to be happening. They already know because they were working with the government behind the scenes. And so that's why I am always, I'm always questioning the, the, the veracity of the, of the stories that I'm hearing on the news. I know there are people behind the world government, people who are financing governments and, and military there's all kinds of dark, very powerful secret societies in the world that are financing the fall of America, the, the destruction of the old Roman Empire again. Rome itself is now in, in a state of collapse, uh, the, just like it fell in the 5th century A.D., the Roman Empire. And when the Roman Empire collapsed, it, it continued after its collapse, we call it the Vatican. The Vatican became the new center for the Roman Empire, and it was. Uh, and the Holy Father was called the Pontifex Maximus. Today, the the Pope is called Pontifex Maximus. That is a 
that is a title that was given to Caesars when they ruled the Roman Empire. They were called the Pontifex Maximus. So I know that there's a continuation of the wars going on in the world to fight off the Roman Empire, and the Roman Empire is undermining the governments of the world and causing the wars and the violence and the revolutions going on throughout the world is nothing more than the Vatican continuing the Roman Empire's wars against civilization to overtake all the different countries of the world and bring us all together into one giant concentration camp, one great one world, world-class world prison in which we will all be under the Roman Empire. We will all be in chains. And this is why in the movie, uh, if you go back to the old movie with Charlton Heston, uh, The Ten Commandments, uh, Charlton Heston was the Jewish uh, prince, and he is and his best friend that he grew up with was a Roman, uh, a Roman official in the Roman government. Right. And in the movie, the Roman official uh, is you know when he sees his his childhood friend uh, Judah Ben Hur. Uh, that's another interesting name, Judah Ben Hur. Ben in Hebrew means the son of. And the word her, H-U-R, is a Hebrew word for Horus. The, the Egyptian uh, sun god Horus in Hebrew is spelled H-U-R. So Judah Ben-Hur was Judah, the son of the god, the, the Egyptian god Horus. So mm. that tells you something. And then when you well, begin to see, like in the movie... Yeah, another uh, thing that's interesting there is that uh, I've seen people describe the Christ figure as Yeshua Ben-Hur, which, again, there was this other figure named Yeshua who does seem to have possibly existed, but uh, he is named Yeshua Ben-Hur, which, again, would mean the same thing. Uh, kind of interesting that that fits exactly in with the story, too. But um, there's one more thing I want to get to before we go to break here. Uh, this is very timely, by the way, because Leslie's email at the very beginning admonishes me for talking too much while you're on, Jordan, just so you know. So <laughs> yeah, um, <clears throat> I, I should really shut up on my show while Jordan is on. I know. I actually do for most part here. Uh, but uh, but I do interject things like this because I think it's valuable to get the feedback. And, again, if you guys want to uh, chime in, feel free to. Next hour we'll take phone calls if you like. Anyway, here we go. Um, I have listened to all ten of your episodes with Jordan Maxwell. Okay. Uh, like I said, complaining again that I'm talking too much. What I take away from it is that the – system of modern religion has been put in place to make sure that the majority of us are fighting with each other. Uh, that we continue to battle over these stories, which are just stories, and therefore it solves two problems for the elites. One, we do not... Uh, we, we do not ever turn our attention on them. And two, that uh, we actually never turn our attention to finding a true path to spiritual enlightenment and uh, evolution right. in general. So, right. they well, uh, let's see, what's her name? I totally agree yeah. with that. She, that yeah, she, well, she said that, that that's exactly what she takes away from it, and she wanted to know what your thoughts were, if that was what uh, what what you think she should be taking away from it. There you go. Leslie, that's your name, Leslie. Okay, go, go ahead, Jordan. I'm sorry. Well, no, but I totally believe that's exactly the case, is that the powers that be over us, they know that all the religions are man-made, dreamt up in the uh, and, and in Europe uh, thousands of years ago, if you understand the Knights Templars, which uh, Indiana Jones movies made famous, the Indiana Jones uh, movies talked about the Knights Templars, the the uh, Indiana Jones and the Last Crusade. That crusade was part of the history of the Knights Templars. If you don't know anything about Knights Templars, you need to. 
You need to understand who they were, the Knights of the Temple of Christ and the Knights of the Temple of Solomon. Today you have the Hebrews, you have the Jews in Jerusalem at the Wailing Wall. We've all seen the, the Jews at the Wailing Wall. They're all praying and putting their prayers into the wall on little pieces of paper. They have no idea in the world, the Jews of this world, as supposedly as brilliant as they are, do not realize that the Wailing Wall has zero, nothing to do with Judaism. It is a Roman fort built by the Romans that has nothing to do with the Solomon's temple. There was no King Solomon, and there never existed. A King Solomon never existed in history. So Solomon could not have had a temple in which the Jews are at the Wailing Wall today. The Wailing Wall is like the Wall Street. The Wailing Wall is nothing more than a Roman temple. It's called Fort Antonia. Go on my website to my research website and look under the religious symbols and you will see that the Wailing Wall was built by the Romans. It's a Roman fort. It's called Fort Antonia. Look it up in the dictionary. It will tell you that in Jerusalem today, the ancient Romans built a temple. It was a fort for the Roman Empire in Jerusalem against the Islamic world. And it was a fort called Antonia. Fort Antonia was a huge wall that was standing, uh, that was one of the big walls that held up the fort. And it's called Fort Antonia, and today the Jews are wailing at the Wailing Wall, thinking it's the wall of King Solomon. It has nothing to do with the King Solomon at all. It's a Roman fort. And the Jews are still there today, wailing at the wall, never realizing you've been had, you've been played for a fool. The Jews who consider themselves to be the superior minds on the earth, the superior people, the highly educated superior minds, have been fooled by the Gentiles again. Rome has fooled the Jews. Mm -hmm. It has deceived. It has deceived the the Gentile peoples of the world. The Romans were not stupid. There were many things, but stupid was not one of them. They were brilliant in their demonic depravity of building their empire. And they would kill and murder anybody to take over the world, the Roman Empire. Mm. So that today, when you start looking at the bottom line on the religion of Judaism, supposedly gave birth to Christianity, you find out that I think Christianity probably existed before uh, before Judaism. I think Christianity was the first religion, and out of Christianity comes Judaism. I believe Judaism is, a, is an A.D. religion. It was not B.C. I think the history of Judaism shows that it was not an ancient religion. There was no such a thing as ancient Israel. It never existed. Therefore, all the stories coming out of the Old Testament Bible about ancient Israel and the ancient Israeli people never existed. There was no ancient Israel in point of fact. And so, therefore, all the stories in the Old Testament are just that. They're stories. And, and it's not me saying this, but some of the best minds in Israel today uh, professors in, in the Israeli institutions of education, higher education in Israel, some of the best minds they have in Israel today, uh, archaeologists, paleontologists, historians are writing books now in Israel about there was no ancient Israel. Mm. All of the ancient kings, like King Solomon and King David, never existed. There was no such a thing as a King David. And one of the oldest uh, <clears throat> copies of the Bible, and I can't remember which one I had it at one time. <clears throat> I'm trying. I would love to find it. It's an old, very old copy of the Bible. And in that particular copy of the Bible, it says every place that you would read today in the modern day Bible about King David, look that scripture up in this particular old Bible, and it will tell you. It's not King David, it's King Druid, D-R-U-I-D, not D-A-V-I-D. King Druid, not King David. Druids 
were a, a religion in, uh, in, in Europe long before the Roman Empire existed. And today we call them King David. No, it wasn't King David. It's King Druid. Look up the word Druid in a dictionary or go to a library or go on the web and type in King Druid or Druid Priest. And it will show you pictures of what the Druid Priest look like. They are exactly dressed like the high priest of Israel. The Jewish high priests were Druids. Druid Priests. This is what Judaism is today as a Druidic religion based, based on Druidism. And one of the most important symbols in the Jewish or Druid religion in the Roman Empire, one of the most important symbols coming out of the Druid religion was a magic wand, like Merlin, the magician in England with his magic wand. Right. And, and, and orchestra leaders and conductors and uh, orchestra conductors how they lead their orchestra with a magic wand. A magic wands were always made out of the wood of a holly tree. It was made out of Hollywood. Mm. And today we know the Jews that run Hollywood. It is a Druidic religion. You, understand, you need to go back and look at Druidism to understand the magic that's being worked on us by what we call the Jewish Hollywood. No, it's not Jewish Hollywood. It's Druidic. Hollywood. There was no King David. It was King Druid. Go back and do some homework and wake up and get a life and start looking at the life you live and start looking at the ideas that you believe and you will find out that uh, virtually nothing that you believe today is true. We've, we've right. been lied to, purposely lied to by the church and you got to question how come the Pope wears the Jewish yarmulke, the little cap that the Pope wears is the same one that the Jews wear. Why? And why do the cardinals wear the Jewish yarmulke? What is that all about? Mm -hmm. You need to start waking up and finding out where Christianity actually, in fact, came from, and how Judaism is nothing more than a story based on, loosely based on, the old ancient world religion of the moon worship, of sun worship, of the worship of, uh, of volcanoes, volcano worship, uh, astrological worship. There's uh, seven major different belief systems coming out of the ancient and prehistoric world of which make up today Judaism. Mm. Judaism is actually based on ancient sun worship. This is why the most important name for God in Hebrew religion and the Jewish religion is a, is a four letters for the name of God. It's called the Tetragrammaton. All uh, synagogues throughout the world, on the altars of the synagogues or in the synagogue, you go to any country in the world, no matter where you go. If it's a Jewish synagogue, you go in, you will see on the altar the symbol for the Almighty God of the Jews. And, then, and there's four letters inside of a sunburst. It's always inside of a round sun with the, with the sunburst. And it's got the four letters for the name of God of the Jews. It's called the Tetragrammaton. Hmm. Tetra is T-E-R-A, Tetra. Tetra is four. Gramma is a letter. Gramma is a letter, like A, B, C. So Tetragrammaton is Tetra. Grammar, four letters for the God of the Jews, which is Aton, Tetragramma Aton, A-T-O-N. The Aton was the Egyptian God of the Sun. Today, we call them the Almighty God, Jehovah, Yahweh. Yahweh was the God of the Sun. He was also the same God as the Islamic worship. Uh, they call him Yahweh. The Jews call it Yahweh, and the Islamic call them Allah. Allah is the same as Yahweh. Yahweh and Allah is the same God, but just coming from a Jewish point of view or from an Islamic, uh, Arabic point of view. Mm. So it's just an incredible story of betrayal, of misunderstanding where these ideas and belief systems have come from. This is why the more the Jews pray to God, 
the bigger the wars and the more bloodier that becomes in the Middle East because Islam uh, is, is is worshiping a moon god, and so is the uh, so are the Jews. The Jews were worshiping a moon god at one time under Moses. Moses was a moon, uh, uh, what we call a moon deity, and uh, he worshipped the moon. And the followers of Moses will still worship the moon today. And right. so, well, when you all see- of this, all of this combining, one must understand that uh, the Wailing Wall plays about as much true spiritual significance in the equation as Hadrian's Wall. It's uh, it's merely the remains of a uh, a military installation for the Roman Empire. That's all it That's was, it. and it was That's created it was. for strategic purposes. But because of the power and the mythos, if you will, of uh, of, of the Roman army and the Roman presence. Uh, I think it uh, somehow took on a spiritual significance to people. And maybe there's a purpose behind that as well. We're a little bit late going to break, but I do want to take the break now because Jordan Maxwell is with me. It is a Monday. We're continuing the series on religion. We're taking your questions and adding them into the equation. And Jordan is running with them here on the O'Kelly Effect. JordanMaxwellShow.com is his website. O'Kelly.com is mine. We'll be right back after this. now, just a little bit late here at Ocelli.com because I took the break late, but uh, my network, I can do what I want. <laughs> so there it is. It's a Monday. We're talking to Jordan Maxwell. This is part 11 of the special series on uh, which, which I call a special dogmatic religion. That is the uh, that is the series. And, and you know what? It makes a lot of sense. It is a, uh, a special series with Jordan Maxwell, uh, which you can go to jordanmaxwellshow.com and go check out many things over there, including the Research Society. You know what? I'm going to put in a separate link, actually, that goes to the Research Society. I'm going to put that in. It's in the chat room at ocelli.com now, but I'm going to put it in with the podcast for those of you who listen to it later. Um, and you can go there and join for a one-time fee and get much deeper into the topics that we're discussing tonight, as well as many other things, including banking, government, uh, just your general space in the world, if you will, life in general, because the birth certificates and things like this, which Jordan talks about. Anyway, uh, looks like I may have lost Jordan temporarily, but I will bring him back in. As I was explaining, uh, you can also get the videos over there on demand, directly streamed to you for just a couple of bucks at jordanmaxwellshow.com. But uh, there's plenty to explore. I encourage you to uh, email Jordan, make a donation, you know, ask questions to Jordan if you like. Uh, we're definitely going to take some questions this hour. And if you want to call in and ask Jordan your question directly, you can do so as well at 252-301-2255. That's 252-301-2255. And if not, let's just say you're international and you're saying, look, I don't want to spend money to call in. I understand you don't want to spend money to call me, but... You might want to spend money to call Jordan. I'll tell you what. I'll make it easier for you if you go on Skype and message Charles Uh I will bring you in, and it won't cost you a dime. And you can ask a question of Jordan Maxwell if you like during this hour, what's left of it anyway. And uh, gladly, I will take those calls, questions in the chat room, questions on the email or on the Skype during this hour. Jordan. Yes, I've already uh, talked about the website and everything else, and uh, I'm really, really happy that we're continuing this. This is part 11 now. (laughs) Mm -hmm. Oh, no, wait a minute. This is part 12. My fault. This is actually the 12th uh, uh, episode here. Yeah, that's right. That's right. Yeah. So uh, wait a minute. You know, uh, I I was just reading on the website over there about uh, the 12 tribes of Israel and all that, Uh, you know, and interesting piece there. But. There's a lot more to this, and uh, you've certainly recapped a bunch of things, answered everybody's questions, uh, even the very interesting one I thought about 9-11, um, you know, and, and the significance of many other things, including wars, uh, uh, truthfully, assassinations occur, uh, you know, and, and a lot of things are ritualized for a reason. It's just that people don't necessarily understand the rituals because... Well, they, they, they have the storefront version of the religion as opposed to the religion itself. 
You know, that's that's the interesting part of this to me is that even though people are ostensibly uh, following the tenets of a religion, they they think they're following one thing, but they're really contributing to something else. And that's what's so interesting. That's why when you said, you know, the people that are uh, uh, praying for peace are asking the wrong person the one night, I think you said, uh, you know, when they're, they're, they're praying to the wrong God if you're asking for peace. It's interesting. I yep. think that, uh, that that is exactly true, and that's one of the most profound short statements you're ever going to hear uh, uh, from you at all is is right there is that you're you're praying to the wrong god that's why your prayers aren't getting answered um and that's pretty interesting in and of itself but jordan i turn it back over to you well i mean the idea being is that by their fruits you shall know them mm. that was a that was a story in the new testament where jesus was was walking along and a group of people came up to him and said, this is a story in the New Testament, it said a group of people came up to Jesus and they showed him some seeds. And they asked him, what kind of seeds are these? And and Jesus looked at them and said, well, why don't you plant the seeds? Go over there and plant the seeds and water it and watch what comes up. If it's an apple tree comes up, well, then that answers your question. It's an apple seed. If a if a uh, if a if a peach tree uh, comes up, then that answers your question. It was a peach seeds, so just plant the seeds and see what comes up. Well, that's the idea. By their fruits, you shall know what seeds they are. By their fruits, you shall know what kind of a tree it is. Well, then we take that into the religious environment. Take that into the story of the religions. Plant the seeds and let's see what comes up. Mm-hmm. Well, we plant the seeds of Judaism and Christianity, and the seeds were planted for Islam. And what does it? What what came from it? What came from those seeds? Well, wars and violence and pornography and child sacrifice and and sex, drugs and rock and roll and all kinds of horrible catastrophes have happened with murdering. Jews being killed in Jerusalem and, and the Islamic wars and the violence and the wars going on in the Middle East and the you know and, and so by their fruits you shall know them. Anybody looking at the religions of the world will begin to think there's something wrong with religion because everywhere religion is very important to countries that are very, very heavily involved in religions. There's going to be bloodshed and violence. There's going to be mistreating of children. There's going to be uh, pedophilia and, and mistreating of women and treating them like animals and, uh, and, and mistreating humans and throwing them into prison and all kinds of horrible things that are happening to the human family where there is a uh, heavy religion, including America. America is a very, very religious country, and we have more crime going on in America than, than the whole world put together. We are the biggest criminals on the earth in America, period. Our country is promoting crime all over the world. We're promoting wars. We are putting together revolutions and riots and, and wars and bloodshed. Our military industrial complex needs a, needs an enemy. You gotta get an enemy. You gotta have an enemy. Why? Because you need a big military. And why do you need a big military? Why? Because you got a horrible enemy. Where did you get the enemy? We made the enemy. We financed him. We, we brought him over here to make him an enemy so that we'll have a reason for having a war. See now, all, all, all of this, all of this is true and and rings so perfectly true, Jordan. But I have a I have a question for you from me at this point, because yeah. you know by by the fruits by their fruits you will know them, right? I mean, look, that's just a very simple. It seems like a good piece of sage advice. Uh, the fact is that that's exactly how you're going to know the difference, even between the trees when they're grown. Right. When they start to bear fruit, sometimes, I mean, a lot of trees can look alike, but, you know, only an apple tree is going to make apples and things like that. What's interesting to me about 
okay, I'm going to objectively step back and look at Christianity and my interactions with it over the years and try and file them. Um, it's fascinating because there is a, a tremendous amount of hypocrisy built into the most Christian people that I encounter uh, one way or another, if they are intensely Christian, it seems like just like you said with a nation, if it's intensely religious, this is where the most horrible things happen. Um, but on the other hand, one could say that, uh, you know, during times of crisis, that there are people that get together uh, in churches and do great things to help their, you know, fellow members of the human family on occasion. And they do that. That is true. You can't state that, uh, you know, hungry people have not been fed by the churches. You can't state that some people haven't been clothed by churches. But what's weird to me is it seems like there's a total disconnect between that and the tax free, you know, thuggery of pushing things around of, uh, uh, you know, sort of uh, uh, enforcing the church's will allegedly on other people, of judging, even though, you know, I thought God was only supposed to judge. Um, it, it, it's like there's two different Christianities. And one of those Christianities, you know, sort of like they say with the Masons, right? There's, uh, you know, the, the, the guys who go to the Freemason Lodge, and they're just there because they want to network for business, and that's really what they're there for. And they're local merchants and they're, you know, different business owners or whatever. And they get together and, of course, they get to uh, socialize with their peers. But on the other hand, there's something else going on with that organization. It seems like the church is exactly the same way, where there are on the ground or, you know, like instead of the porch masons you have or, you know, whatever it is you want to call them, you have uh, individuals who are of a, of a good heart and mind who belong to these organizations and really do put in the effort to do a good thing on the planet now and then. And yet there is still this really corrosive, nasty, evil vein of something running straight through the center of the organization that these people belong to. And I've always had a hard time trying to wrap my mind around it because not every Christian individual I meet is evil not every one of them is so uh, contradictory to their beliefs. I mean, nobody's perfect or anything like that, but really the run-of-the-mill person who's not trying to shove it, you know, shove the Bible down somebody's throat constantly is usually a, a good person who just has a belief and and they, they stick to the surfaces of it and they're, they're a decent person. So it, it's very weird to me how you reconcile. Two things which I know to be true is that there are some very good people who are part of that organized religion. And at the same time, it, it, it is so deceptive, destructive, and uh, divisive, corrosive. I, I, a lot of different adjectives I could put in here. The church as a whole. I mean, how is that or is that exactly what the design was meant to be? Or do you think... It's just, you know, part of a cover-up, and they just use good people to cover up the uh, the situation. Uh, how, how, what, what, do you, what do you do with that in your mind, Jordan? I think it is all attributable to, uh, it all goes back to what I said last time, that the biggest problem the human family on the earth today faces, the single biggest problem is human ignorance, ill-informed, unread, uh, ignorance, you know, we need to go back to school and learn how to read and think and question, and 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 that's the biggest problem we face is that people, generally speaking, are not very well educated. All around the world, we're in the dark. People are ignorant, ill-informed. They don't know what's going on in the rest of the world. They don't even know what's going on in their own family. And so that's the problem because people, good people, you know, the ones that we would think of would be good and decent Christian people are ignorant, ill-informed, unread, and downright, uh, downright, un they have no idea in the world what history is about. They have no idea how their country was founded. They have no concept in their mind about how government works. Why there? Why we have a police department? Why do we have a government? 
What did the words and the terms that we use every day, where did they come from? Why do you have to go to court because you play tennis on a court? Most people don't think about where things come from. They're just ignorant, ill-informed ignorance. I think it was Kirk Douglas once said in an interview that to be born ignorant is an unavoidable accident, but to remain that way is criminal negligence. Mm -hmm. You need to wake up and realize how much you don't know and start going back to school and learn how to read, learn how to think, and learn what you know, how the world works and start to question your belief system, start to question everything. Start to question America, uh, question Russia, question the way the world works. And people have no idea in the world how banks work. They don't know if a bank is, desi is designed to do a certain thing. It has nothing to do with, you know, with money. It has to do with the control of the human family. You need to realize where the ideas of a bank came from, the Knights Templars. One of the oldest Masonic orders is called the Knights Templars. The Knights Templars developed what we call today banking and writing checks. You, you know, you, you, when you write a check today and you can send it across the country and the check is still good when it gets to a different location, that's the Knights Templars did that many, many years ago. The Knights Templars set up something they called the banking, international banking, from one country to another. They were a secret society, and they operated in different countries. But they all worked together as a one team, like organized crime. They all worked together. There were different mobs, but they worked together. And so the Knights Templars in one country would honor the, the checks in another country. So if you would write a check today and put it into the bank, then you could go to Russia and get that money out in Russia. They will honor that check that's in the bank in, in America. They will honor it in Russia. They will honor it in South Africa. Why? Because it's one operation. It's the same secret society running all banks on the earth, period. And they trust each other. They have a whole system that we were born into. We don't even understand it, how it works, or why we use the same, the words that we do, how our money works, how our governments work. You, you really need to understand that the world was designed by people, criminals, before you were born. You know, back in the 1700s, things were happening on this land that we call America. 1776, it was a governmental arrangement set up on this land that we call America today. And, and we are, then when we're born, we come into this land, we come into this governmental arrangement, and we just accept it. Well, you have to. You might as well, everybody else accepts it. You might as well, as a baby, you accept it. And so you grow up uh, uh, realizing that this is the government you live under and you just live by the, by the decrees of the government. Whatever the government says, they're the boss. It never uh, dawned on you, never even occurred to you the question, who set up this government we call the United States of America? What were the, what were the bylaws and why did, why do we have certain ideas of belief systems and symbols? Why do we have a red, white, and blue? Where does that come from, that color system, symbol of red, white, and blue? It goes back to the Temple of Solomon in the Bible. It goes back to the biblical stories in the Bible. And why do you have a Department of Justice, a Justice Department? Well, it goes back to Moses. Moses is a statue. The statues of Moses all in the Department of Justice. Moses was the great lawgiver. And, of course, when he came down from the mountain and saw the Jews worshiping the golden calf, he threw the law down, the Bible says, and he broke the stones of the law. So he was the first lawbreaker. Mm. That's where we get the term, breaking the law, because that's what Moses did. He broke the law. And so... If, like I said, the, the the study is called pattern recognition. Right. The, we have patterns that have been set up for us for thousands of years before we came into this world, mm -hmm. and we just accept things uh, that because 
most people are too busy living their lives and trying to raise their children and, and build their homes and buy their cars and live and stay alive and pay their bills. They don't have time to look at where things have come from. Myself, I purposely knew when I was in my teens, I already knew what I wanted to do. I dedicated myself knowingly. I wanted to be able to know where things come from. Why do we believe what we believe? And how did they get started? Who was, where was the first time a particular belief system existed? And why do I accept it myself? Why do I understand and believe the same thing that the ancient peoples of the world believed? Why? Where did it all come from? I wanted to know. Right. Speaking and of I, uh, where did things come from, Jordan, we've got two more questions. One of them is from Lori, and uh, she wants to know, let's see, uh, where is it? Question two, Jordan. Oh, uh, did the Knights Templar originate in Jerusalem? Is the question from Lori. And no, okay, no, <laughs> no. That was pretty no, easy. They did not. That was pretty easy. No, very simple. <laughs> okay. Uh, the other one is uh, let's see. It's from uh, Josh, and he wants to know about. Uh, oh, the. Um, Right, here we go. Jeho oh, Jehovah's Witnesses, are they simply a sub-cult of Christianity, or are they on to something because they speak of prophecy constantly and the fulfillment of prophecy? Um, I Jehovah's guess your, your Witnesses, view on Jehovah's Witnesses is what he yes, wants. Jehovah's Witnesses are a Masonic, pre-Masonic cult. And run by Zionist Jews. Zionist Jews develop what we call the Jehovah's Witnesses. Jehovah's Witnesses are a Masonic cult. Okay. They were developed during the 1800s, 1860s, 1870s by what we call Zionists. The, and Charles Tess Russell was himself a Zionist and he was a, he was a, he was a promoter of the Zionist movement. And when originally the Watchtower Society was referred to, and the original name for Jehovah's Witnesses was the Zion's Watchtower Society. Wow. They, they, they preached Zionism at the beginning of their, the beginning of the organization. As a matter of fact, I can tell you many things about Jehovah's Witnesses that Witnesses do not know. Today, people are still being sucked into the Masonic Order uh, the, the Masonic Knights Templar Order who founded the Jehovah's Witnesses. They were called the International Bible Students Association, IBSA, International Bible Students Association. And they were founded in Philadelphia, the city of brotherly love. We talk about Philadelphia being the city of brotherly love. And this is where Jehovah's Witnesses started in Philadelphia. But when you see the city of brotherly love, they're not talking about Christians being brothers and sisters and loving each other. No, we're talking about the Masonic order. And the scripture talks about in the Bible that how good it is to see uh, uh, men coming together to love each other and work with each other. Well, that is the Masonic order in Philadelphia, the city of brotherly love. The Masons call themselves brothers, and it's the brothers this and the brothers are doing that. So as the city of Philadelphia it goes back to the word Philadelphia, and that, this is why one of the Jehovah's Witness offshoots was called the Christadelphians. Christadelphians comes from the word Philadelphia, and they were Christians in Philadelphia or Christadelphians. Uh, you know, Jehovah's Witnesses are a Masonic order designed to mislead people into believing that the new world order that's coming will be uh, a Christian order in which the whole world will be in peace and happiness and there will be all kinds of wonderful world coming, and which is totally not true. It is a Masonic order's promotion of a, of an idea to to suck in all of the poor, ignorant, and ill-informed, and unread 
working class people of the world to accept the idea of a new world order. That's what even the Zion's Watchtowers as far back as 1870s talked about, the new world order that's coming. And they were called the New World Order of Jehovah's Witnesses. And Jehovah's Witnesses were nothing more than the worship of Jehovah, which was a Jewish a Jewish term the Zionists use. And so Jehovah's Witnesses were originally founded in Philadelphia. They eventually moved to Brooklyn, New York. Is there anybody on the earth that does not know that Brooklyn is the home of the Mafia? Is there anybody that doesn't know what Philadelphia is? The mob operates in Philadelphia, and it operates in New York, the Empire State. Uh, it's, a, it's a very powerful secret society that operates behind what they call Jehovah's Witnesses. It is a Masonic order founded by Freemasons. It's a very interesting, dark and deep uh, organization, very successful at manipulating and exploiting the poor and the innocent and the ill-informed and the unread people who are, you know, are just trying to stay alive and want to do something to see the earth better place. And so the uh, organizational arrangement came out of Europe. It's a Masonic organization in Europe that gave birth to what we call British Israel, and the British Israel movement gave birth to something called Millerism. Uh, there, was a, there was a guy in Philadelphia called William L. Miller. And Miller uh, was promoting what he called the Seventh Day, the Second Adventist Movement, of which the Seventh Day, the Seventh Day Adventists are, are, they continue. They were part of Jehovah's Witnesses a long time ago, Jehovah's Witnesses. Charles Tez Russell was a second Adventist, and that was another Masonic order in, in Europe called the Adventist, Second Adventist Movement. Go back and look at William L. Miller and find out who he was and how he was connected to the British Israel World Federation, and he was promoting the idea that the whole advent of Jesus coming back and the whole new world order is going to happen in America and America is going to be the home of the new world order. Mm. Now I'm voicing these comments as we go, but uh, you can call in at 252-301-2255 if you like and ask the question yourself or make the comment yourself if, if you want, guys listening out there, uh, you know, guys, girls, whatever. Uh, if you're listening, you can do that right now as we speak on this Monday night. But if you're hearing this in podcast form, well, sorry, can't be done. Uh, one of the comments that comes here is uh, also comes with a question, which I guess is about uh, Mr. Russell. Uh, let's see. It, it, it appears as though the Jehovah's Witnesses were founded by a 33rd degree Mason and uh, none of his prophecies came true. Does Jordan believe this? <laughs> that is the well, the whole question there. I understand Charles Tess Russell was a, was a high degree Mason, and that all of his prophecies did not come true. Uh, I don't have any problem with that because nobody else's prophecies have come true either. So uh, you know, I was just going to ask you about that when this came up, because so many of these doomsday, uh, you know, prophecies have been yeah. sort of spread. Yeah. We, we, we were supposed to be, you know, dead in the year 2000 when, you know, 99 rolled over into the year 2000, the Y2K scare. We were supposed to be dead in 1984 because it was 1984. We were supposed to be all dead in 2012, Jordan, uh, because the world was going to end because the Mayan calendar ended. Uh, and, and as per usual, there have been doomsday cults and doomsday offshoots of various religions um, yep. for hundreds of years that I can easily track. But it's probably a lot longer than that, where, you know, the sun is simply not going to rise tomorrow. This is usually one of their big things. No more sun. Um, now, here's a question I have for you, because you talked about the Seventh-day Adventists. And, uh, you know, that's an interesting group of people, too, because to me, they're sort of like Catholics, except they go to church on Saturday. Um, you that's know, because they're worshiping the planet Saturn. Right. <laughs> um, as opposed it's to Saturn's Sunday. Day. Yeah. yeah. 
uh, cause that would be Saturn day. Right. Um, but what's, uh, what's interesting here is that there've been a lot of offshoots of the seventh day Adventists that seem to go in all sorts of directions. You have, uh, th- this concept about the second Adventist person creating, uh, uh, Jehovah's Witnesses, but indeed, even David Koresh was apparently, you know, part of that group, uh, that, that had it er- originated as a sort of a radical piece of the seventh day Adventist church. That's and there right. are a lot of them. Pentecostals who, uh, you know, believe in, uh, uh, a lot of that speaking in tongues and all of that stuff. And it just seems to me like, I, I don't know if this is an, a, 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 uh, continuation of the original religion or if this is a throwback to something else. What do you think of these, uh, interesting offshoots that seem to grow every few years? We hear about a new one. Yeah, well, I think that's exactly what they are. They're just offshoots of older religions. But most people, as I said before, do not have time to trace back the ancient history of religions and where the different philosophies of religion come from and where the idea of a Messiah comes from. Messiah goes back to the Hindus. The whole idea of a Messiah was perfected in in Egypt. It was born and raised in, in India, but it was perfected in Egypt. Egyptians perfected the idea of a Messiah who would come back and save the world. That was That's an old concept going back to the ancient Egyptians, which actually can be traced back further to the Hindus. So when I hear in Christianity talk about the Messiah who's coming back, I know. Oh, my God, it's the same old story going back to the Hindus, going back to the Egyptians, going back to the ancient Romans. Same old story. It just never stops. It's the same old story about the Messiah who's going to die on the cross and was resurrected in three days, and he came back to life, and he's coming here to save the world. And I know that this is nothing more than just a story of the Son. The Son is your son is your savior and of course the son is your savior and he is risen of course that's what the son does it rises every morning where he is your risen savior of course the son is your risen savior if it doesn't rise we're going to freeze to death we're going to be dead in three weeks so so i understand where these ideas have come from that's why i don't buy into them i know where they come from i know what they meant originally I know what it meant in Egypt to be a Messiah. I know what it meant in Hindu to be a Messiah. And we talk about Messiahs were anointed. There's another word that Christians use and Jews use and the people of the world religions use. We all use the word anointed. We know that the kings of in Europe, kings and queens and princes of Europe were all anointed. <clears throat> and the word anointed simply means to have oil poured on your head. And then, and once the oil was poured on you, you were said to be the new king of England. And that was a ritual that you had to go through to be the king. You sat in the king's chair, and the Archbishop of Canterbury, the head of the Church of England, would take a big silver spoon <clears throat> and dump it into a big bowl of oil with that big silver spoon. He would pour out oil on your head, and you were said to be the anointed king of England. Anointing was pouring oil on your head. And so everybody thinks that's so holy. No, it had to do with lubricating the, the, the phallic and sex. So it goes back into the ancient Grecian Empire. It goes back into the ancient Phoenician Babylonian empires where the males would uh, anoint their phallic symbols with oil poured on the head. Yes, the head of the penis. That's why the kings were called the great the great fathers. They were the father of their nation. It goes back to being able to be a father to give life to a nation, to give life to a country. And so, therefore, you pour oil on the head of the king. It was called anointing. So Christians talk about Jesus being anointed and not not realizing anointing means sex. It has to do with sex. The whole idea of anointing is a sexual symbol. 
This is why you pour oil on the fella. Uh, the male member was, was lubricated with oil <clears throat> in the ancient world. And that's why today we still keep holy the Lord's Day. <clears throat> we still keep holy the Sabbath. Sabbath is based on the word Shabbat. <clears throat> Shabbat was the planet Saturn in the Phoenician Canaanite system of religion thousands and thousands of years ago in what we call Israel today it was recalled that area was called the land of, of Cana Cana land the land of Cana <clears throat> and in the land of Cana they would anoint their 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 kings would be anointed with oil and so we think that's a wonderful and holy term to, to be anointed never realizing though it has to do with sex lubricating the male before sex that's anointing look it up in the dictionary you will find that you what you're doing is you are buying into religions of the ancient world that you have no idea in the world what the words mean and where these ideas have come from again the one of the basic tenets of all three of the major religions of this world today Christianity, Judaism and Islam one of the main important fact of features of the three major religions is sex sex is a very important part of all three major religions sexual interest in the Islamic world is obvious when you can marry a little seven year old girl <clears throat> you can marry a seven year old in, in Islam and if you and what you can do also in Islam, we call it child child abuse here in America, but it's the same thing in in in, uh, in the Islamic world. That if you're a grown man, you can rent a child for the night. It's called there's a word for it. You can you can rent the child by paying the parents a certain amount of money, uh, which is uh, the idea is that you are marrying that child for the night just for that night you have to bring them back the next day but you can marry the child for uh, at night for one night unless you want to keep them for a couple of days you just have to pay uh, that amount of money and you can marry the child for the night and then bring them back the next morning and so that kind of stuff is going on in Islam all over the world child child abuse you know pornography uh, you know, and of course, we know all about what's going on in the Catholic Church, in the Roman Church, the same thing with pedophilia and the <clears throat> the, the the worship of sex in the in Christianity. And then, of course, we see a lot of that kind of stuff <clears throat> going on in religion, period, all over the world. We've got a big problem with that sex and drugs and money and materialism and all this stuff goes back into the ancient world of Babylon and going back into the ancient Assyrian, Babylonian, Phoenician, Canaanite world. Today, what we call Israel is nothing more than the old ancient land of Cana. Mm -hmm. And the Baal worshippers, the Canaanites, ancient Canaanites worshipped the sun, and they called the sun B-A-A-L, Baal. Baal was the sun, <clears throat> and they were sun worshippers, so they worshipped Baal. But they were from the land of Cana, which we call Israel today, the land of Cana, and they were Baal worshippers or sun worshippers. Well, today we know that in the ancient Baal worship in Cana, you would you would put to death the child, you would uh, you know sacrifice the child, a child sacrifice. Then you would burn the body on an altar. You would burn, set it on fire and burn the body of the child or the person you you killed uh, to worship your god. And the god wanted to smell the flesh burning. The, the ancient scripture says that the Baal loved to smell the burning of human flesh. So therefore, you bring some child in, you kidnap the child or bring them in, and you put them to death and then you burn them. But that, and then you put you put them to the to the torch and you burn them. But the scripture says also that the Baal worshippers of Cana would have to eat the sacrifices. 
So once you cook the body of the person you killed, you have to eat it. If you were a Baal, uh, a Baal priest, a priest of Baal in the land of Canaan, this is where we get our word cannibal, Cana Baal, because the Baal worshippers would eat their sacrifices in Cana. So Cana Baal is a cannibal, and this is where all of this idea comes from. So when you begin to see that mm-hmm. your religion is actually a Phoenician Canaanite religion, and that you are putting to death someone to offer up a sacrifice, well, that's what Jesus was offered up as a sacrifice to God. Jesus was put to death mm-hmm. in Cana, the land of Cana. Today we call it Israel. No, Israel is what we call the land of Cana. And so when you read in the Bible about those old ancient Egyptians, or the ancient Canaanites, especially the ancient Canaanites were evil and bad people. You read in the Bible and the Christians will tell you, oh man, the, the Canaanites were evil. They were sex worshiping. They were pagans. Horrible people, these ancient Canaanites never realizing that the land of Cana is what you call Israel today. Well, and another of, another interesting uh, aspect of this, because we're, we're getting close to that time where we're going to run out of time, another interesting aspect to the word cannibal is that in some ancient tongues, what that would have literally meant is a high priest of Baal. Uh, in order to become, see, kind of, it's it's a weird thing. You, you could you could equate it to the uh, to the land of Cana. Right, the 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 land where the Canaanites dwelled, or yeah. you could uh, relate it to the high priests of Baal, which uh, is is a deity. Now, some people think that's a, a you know, uh, quite honestly, the, the term Lord, uh, I think, comes from the worship of Baal as well. So, it almost means that you are a priest of the Lord, if you will, if you're a cannibal. Yeah, um, the word yeah. the word Baal, B A A L is translated today from the old Canaanite religion uh, is called the Lord. So when you hear about Christ the Lord, you're talking about Christ the the Canaanite God of the Son. Well, that's what we call Jesus, God's Son, the light of the world. He is the Son. And the Son is the light of the world. And then it does, it is your risen Savior. Of course, it rises every morning, it is your Savior. And it has 12 helpers. It has 12 months of the year. The 12 signs of the zodiac in heaven are the 12 helpers of God's Son, the light of the world. Mm. So that we, today we have the 12 helpers of, of the God's Son, is the called, is the, we call them the 12 apostles. Well, the Jews have something called the 12 uh, prophets of the Old Testament, the 12 tribes of Israel the 12 uh, stones on the breastplate of the high priest, 12 in Judaism is the same reason why in Christianity you have the 12 apostles. Everything is done in the sequence of 12. Why 12? Because it has to do with the 12 signs of the zodiac. That's why in the in the painting, the famous painting of the <clears throat> Last Supper, <clears throat> the painting of the Last Supper, if you look at the painting, that very famous painting of Jesus at the Last Supper, to his right, to Jesus' right, the first apostle sitting next to Jesus on his right is a woman. Why? One of the twelve apostles was a woman. <clears throat> Why? Because the twelve apostles are based on the twelve signs of the zodiac, the twelve months of the year. It's the life of the son. God's son is is being, his whole life is devoted to his 12 followers, the 12 uh, signs of the zodiac of the 12 months of the year. And why does Jesus have a female? Because one of the 12 signs of the zodiac is Virgo, the virgin. Virgo, the virgin. Is that familiar, that Mm -hmm. Jesus was born of a virgin? Yes, that's where it comes from. Virgo, the Virgin, is a constellation of the Zodiac. It's a study of the stars. And the whole idea of Christianity and Judaism is based on the star worship, worshippers of the moon, the sun, the planets. All of the different ideas coming out of Judaism and Christianity are astrology. That's where it comes from. But we don't want to know that. We don't want to hear that. 
people don't want to hear that. Why? Because they have an idea about how holy <clears throat> everything is and how holy the Bible is and find out the only thing holy are the stories that come out of Israel today. They're full of holes. Once you understand where these ideas have come from and what Israel was all about, why it was called Israel, there's a reason why they call that place Israel. It goes back to Isis. Isis was a goddess in Egypt. And Isis was replaced in Egypt by another god, Amun-Ra. Amun-Ra is Amun-Re. We, we put a Y on it. It's just Amun, A-M-E-N, hyphen R-A, Amun-Ra. Amun is Amen-Ra. So since Jesus is God's son, the light of the world, we say, the Egyptians said, that you, no man can see God. No one's ever seen God. But you can see his son, S-U-M. You can see his son, his offspring, his boy. His son was Jesus. And so when you've seen Jesus, the Bible says, if you saw Jesus, you've seen the Father. He who sees the Son will see the Father. Because Jesus represented the Son. It's a metaphysical term. It's, it's a symbolic term that represents the Son worship of Egypt. And so God's Son, the light of the world, and, uh, and his name was, uh, when, uh, and nobody can see God, but you can send your prayers through his Son to the Father. And so you pray to God's Son, and at the end of your prayer, you say, Amen. Why? Because the Son God in Egypt was called Amen Re, Amen Ra, the Son. Amen Ra, and, and of course in Rome it was Mithra, R-A, Mithra, the Son God. And that's why there was a, a whole cult worshiping the Caesar because he was a representative of the sun god. He were, he brought light into the world. All of this is nothing more than ancient history. It's ancient religious history. This is why people who study ancient religious history and study it for 60 years become, usually they become uh, atheist, never realizing that in the ancient in the ancient Roman world, Christians, when Christianity first developed in Rome, the Christians were referred to by the Romans, according to the encyclopedias, Christians were referred to as atheists. A lot of people don't know that, but if you were a Christian in Rome, the first thing they would, the Romans would call you is an atheist, because you don't believe in the Roman gods. You don't bow to the Roman statues and the Roman gods. Right. And you know what? Today, a lot of people would say you're an atheist if you don't believe in one of the three Abrahamic religions, uh, regardless of what your spirituality actually is or what your belief system is. They simply uh, they simply attach that to you and call you an atheist. I've been called an atheist. I am not. Uh, I'm not I, either. But I don't subscribe to any of these systems, you see. You can, yep. by the way, you the listener, not Jordan. Jordan knows a lot and knows, you know, he, he's probably forgotten more than most of us ever get to know. So what you do is go over to Jordan Maxwell's show altogether, jordanmaxwellshow.com. Uh, get into the research society over there. You know, it's, there, there's a one time joining, uh, you know, membership fee over there and it's, it's not that much. You can get right on in and study these subjects in depth along with a great many other subjects, uh, which are tied directly to it. None of these things are unrelated when it comes to the monetary system, when it comes to the way government has been set up, when it comes to the way that history has unfolded, militaries have conducted themselves. In fact, one of these days, I think we should talk about the Symbolism in our military today and how that is really a religious order as well. Uh, right. Because, you know, I, I'm hearing all this stuff and thinking about the Marines and thinking about the different symbols and ranks which are applied to people, you know. There's something to be said about all that, but we're not going to get to it today, Jordan, because we're out of time. JordanMaxwellShow.com. Again, you can go over there and see some of the stuff in public. You can get a couple of these videos over there on demand right away uh, for a very small fee. You can make a donation. You can send an email to Jordan. Uh, all of these things I encourage you to do. 
because, uh, you know, Jordan has over more than half a century taken the time to collect some of the most unique knowledge possible. He is uh, a, a grand living teacher as far as I'm concerned, and I'm extremely blessed take that for what it's worth i'm extremely blessed to uh to have him come on this show as many times as he has and to do this special series with us of which this was part il uh oh, whoop almost said it again part 12 interesting number 12 that is but uh jordan is there anything you'd like to say here with the last minute or so I would say that if you're interested in all that I'm talking about, if you really care about what you believe, if you really care about your life and you've given your life to a religion, you might want to go on jordanmaxwellshow.com and go to my research society. It's right there in front of you. It'll be pop up right in front of you on the screen. It says join Jordan Maxwell Research Society. Join it. You click on that and join my research uh, society, which is simply another website in which I have downloaded or uploading all of my uh, research materials, pictures and documents and all kinds of audios and lectures to listen to, uh, words to research, ideas and concepts, and, and, and just an enormous amount of research on all the things that we believe as humans on the earth and where it really comes from and what all the stuff really means. And you can go and see it for yourself. Right. And do email me. And just remember that I get a lot of emails. I'll read them all. I try and read all of my emails, but doesn't I don't necessarily have the time to get back to everyone, so I do the best I can. But do email me and let me know that you care. I'm trying to do what I'm trying to do is educate the people of this world. Let me know that you care by emailing me and telling me that. Right. I appreciate being on the show with you. And uh, and Chuck, any time you want to do a show, I'm always here. I always try and be here for you. Well, I, I really appreciate that, Jordan. You know, it, it's been a great privilege to uh, to have you on as many Mondays as we have. Obviously, I want to continue this next Monday if you're available. Yep, okay. That's fine with me. Excellent. I'll, uh, I'll, I'm sure we'll have a lot to talk about. We've got more questions coming, so I'm sure. Exactly. We sure yep. do, but this one is all done. JordanMaxwellShow.com.